Today I'd like to present a video about a one-key flute by Edward Riley, a famous maker from New York State. One of the things that is very fun about collecting flutes and playing them and demonstrating them is the contrast between the different styles of flutes and the different characteristics of different countries in how they made instruments. Uh, the American makers are often neglected uh, over the fancy European models, but they are in fact really pretty special instruments, and I think this is a good example. Edward Riley was active as an instrument dealer and maker from about 1819 to 1829. After he went out of business, his son Frederick took over and made very similar flutes. I, I had a four key flute by Frederick Riley, which was really quite similar to this flute. Um, Edward was born in England in 1769 and immigrated to New York in 1805. He made his living principally as an engraver of music. In those days, you had a, a metal tablet and you would engrave all of, the, uh, all of the notation and it would be printed off of these metal plates. So he was one of the people who would do this work. He also was a flutist and a singer and um, a general teacher of music. In 1820, he started his business um, both as a music engraver, but also as a woodwind instrument maker. In 1811, he published a flute method, which unfortunately I haven't been able to get a hold of a copy at this time. And then between 1814 and 1820, he published four books of what he called his flute melodies, and this contains about 1,300 uh, different tunes, English, Irish, a little bit of French, and some American tunes that uh, many people still know today. Uh, interestingly, a lot of these tunes go back quite a ways, some to the 17th century or, or 18th century. They always get changed a little bit as they're passed on, but these versions that Riley uses are really quite nice. One of the things I always try to do when I demonstrate flute is to match up the music with the particular flute, to have music that really makes sense on that flute and would have been music that somebody from the time who owned this flute would have played. And in this case, that's really easy because I'm just using things from Riley's uh, first and second book, uh, Flute Melodies. I'm playing eight different tunes on here. They're, they're fairly short. Um, I think there's a lot of contrast between the tunes, and so they're interesting to listen to. The first one is Earl of Moriah's Welcome to Scotland. That is also known under the name of County of London Strathspey. Then there's a tune called Lullaby, which I think is very beautiful. I don't know any history of that tune. The third tune is Trip to the Cottage, which was a very popular Irish jig. Then Durandarte and Balerma, which was a Spanish tune that dates back to the 18th century. The Maid of Seton Vale, which was a Scottish ballad, also from the late 18th century. Paddy Carey's Fortune, which is also known as Irish Promotion, written by Jay Whitaker a quite well-known tune called O Ponder Well, which was from the Beggar's Opera of 1729. It actually, the, the tune is probably older than that, but it became very popular once it was in the Beggar's Opera. Finally, one called Cowden Broom, which is also known by the name Bonnie May. And it's a Scottish ballad that dates back into the 17th century and it was included in Playford's English Dancing Master. It's quite interesting to see the diversity of these tunes, which were kind of the bread and butter of American tune playing. Another reason that Edward Riley was so important is that he had working for him the two makers, John Firth and William Hall, who were 
uh, to go on to marry his two daughters, and they went on to form probably the most successful flute businesses in the next generation uh, of American flute building. This particular flute, um, I think, is quite special. It came to me just recently. It was found uh, by someone in Vermont in a blanket chest that they bought at a sale or an, an antique store or something. Um, mixed in with a bunch of cloth and newspapers and stuff was this flute as well as a fife. Uh, the fife is interesting in that it's not a normal B flat fife, it's a C fife. So it's a, a shorter, brighter, uh, more lively type of fife. But the extraordinary thing about this flute is that it's really in mint condition. It, it looks like, uh, you know, it may have been played a little bit, but nobody has ever messed with it. It has all the original string. Um, it, it has no cracks. Well, it has one little tiny crack down here in the key mount that needs to be fixed, but that doesn't affect how the flute plays. It has a big, lively, full sound. It plays very well. The whole range of the low D is very strong. It plays all the way up to high, high A. And one thing I'd like to mention about it that I think um, makes it especially nice, uh, I, I made a video a couple of years ago where I demonstrate five different American flutes. And one of my points in that video was that a lot of American flutes were these flutes that are made to play tunes were also made to favor the key of D major. And so they had a very nice F sharp, but you couldn't really play an F natural on them. They, they were not seen as a fully chromatic instrument. This flute is still in the fully chromatic style. Uh, so this can play music that has F naturals in it. It has a few little idiosyncrasies in the tuning. The, the third octave D is quite sharp. And a few other notes are, are a little bit funny, but it, um, it's really a great flute. It's very, very fun to play. It has a beautiful embouchure hole. I hope that you enjoy hearing this flute.